Hello, and welcome to the second lecture of chapter three. This is your host, your fearless leader, Dr. B, and I am hopefully going to uh, not have so much trouble with these slides, but we never know because they uh, felt a little slow the first time. When we last talked, which for you was probably just a click ago, um, we were talking about the parts of the brain and I stopped on this one, which is the midbrain. So let me remind you that the midbrain sits right below the thalamus, um, kind of uh, along the same pathway of the brain as the brain stem. As you can see, it's connected to the pons, the medulla, um, and it basically consists of a couple of little structures. Um, the ones that you can see here in the slide are the inferior and superior colliculi, those little bumps right below the thalamus. Um, it is, uh, plays a role in, those are the secondary roles in vision and audition, uh, as well as movement. Um, because remember those dopamine neurons that leave the uh, ventral tegmental area, which is not in this figure, uh, and go to an area called the substantia nigra, um, is in the uh, basal ganglia area. And the basal ganglia is that secondary movement center. So you're getting dopamine to that movement center um, through the midbrain. So from the midbrain, from the VTA or ventral tegmental area up to the substantia nigra, which is basically um, part of the basal ganglia. And so when those dopamine neurons are destroyed and dopamine can't go from the VTA to the substantia nigra, which just means black substance um, because those neurons apparently look black. Then you have the movement problems associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, so we have the superior colliculi, the inferior colliculi, and then we have kind of a little hole in the middle where the pons and medulla kind of meet. And you can kind of see a ominous, almost ghost-like, <laughs> um, gray black stuff, um, which in this case running up through a network of nerves that runs through the medulla and pons and up on the inner side of the midbrain to the thalamus are um, or is called the um, reticular formation. And what the reticular formation is, is it controls our levels of arousal and it is basically um, a network or a tract of axons um, that secretes or releases norepinephrine because that's our level of arousal in the body. So the main area for the levels of arousal goes through the brainstem, through the midbrain, up to the thalamus, and that's called going to say mainly and basically, and I said masonly. Um, basically, it is the medulla and the pons. Uh, it forms part of the reticular formation that goes up through the midbrain to the thalamus, as I just said, and it includes the cerebellum. So uh, what I always talk about with my Psych 1 class is that the lower you are in the brain, the more of the old brain we get, which we share a lot of these things with uh, lower animals, lower vertebrates, um, mice, rats, any other sort of mammal, animal, um, even some that are not, like rodents. Um, and the lower you go in the brain, the more primitive the behavior it is that um, it controls. So the pons is uh, made up of the white matter axons. As you can see, it's kind of a whitish color in this um, drawing and or this graph, whatever you want to call it, graphic, whatever you want to call it. And it is sending those axons from the motor cortex and maybe also from the secondary areas like the basal ganglia to the spinal cord to go down to the muscles. Um, and I guess um, information, a little bit of information goes up through the pons as well, but mainly it's, it's controlling movement because it's sending motor information down to the spinal cord, which will then go down to the individual muscles. 
The medulla is um, that part at the very bottom that connects the brain to the spinal cord for that central nervous system. And um, before you're even born, or when you're first born, as I said, I think yesterday, um, or whatever the last, uh, whenever the last uh, lecture was for me, um, I don't know what time it is these days, uh, is heartbeat and breathing. So before you can even cry, before you can even latch onto mom, before you can even look around with your eyes or turn your head, the two things that need to happen when you come down the slide and you're born is you need to be able to uh, breathe and you need to have a heartbeat. Your heart has to be pumping blood through the body. If those two things are not going on, you're not going to have the ability to do anything else. So the medulla is the most important life survival functions of breathing and heart rate. Uh, behind the brain stem, which is made up of the medulla and the pons, is a little part that kind of looks like a little cerebral cortex. Um, and that is the cerebellum, which actually stands for, or is Latin for, little cerebrum. So it looked to people who first discovered it like a small part uh, a small little cerebral cortex underneath it in the back. And the cerebellum is, uh, for more, all intents and purposes here, the, um, it helps to coordinate fine motor movement. So the fact that you can coordinate walking or coordinate a dance or be able to hit a ball going, you know, 50, 60, 90 miles an hour. Uh, the fact that you can coordinate your muscles to be able to shoot a free throw and make it consistently. Sorry, Shaq. Um, that those uh, require coordination from the cerebellum, uh, playing a musical instrument and coordinating your fingers and everything. Um, that's why when somebody is intoxicated, as we talked about in chapter five, um, the cerebellum seems to be the first thing to shut down due to GABA. Um, and so people may be awake, but they're, uh, the more they drink, the more they can't walk in a straight line because the cerebellum for all those intents and purposes is shut down. The cerebellum is also involved in things like um, unconscious processing. So when we are um, automatically learning some sort of classically conditioned response, and you guys all know what classical conditioning is because you all had psych one. Um, that sort of thing is, um, is what's happening. Um, so that's the hindbrain. So the three parts of the brain are the forebrain, which is basically the cerebral cortex and the uh, subcortical structures. And uh, the midbrain is this little area right here below the thalamus. And then the hindbrain, um, medulla, pons, and cerebellum. So now you have a good um, idea of what is in the brain. Um, and attached to the medulla is a very special, um, very important part of the central nervous system. It's the other half. It's the spinal cord. And as I pointed out in the last lecture, we saw that the dark matter, gray matter, dark matter, now I sound like a science fiction show. The gray matter was on the outside of the brain when we looked through the slices, those coronal slices. Uh, and I told you guys that in the spinal cord, it's kind of the opposite. What you see on the outer edges here is the gray matter. And what you, I'm sorry, is the white matter. What you see on the outer edges um, is the, on the lateral sides of the spinal cord section is the white matter. And what you see towards the middle is the gray matter. That's where the cell bodies uh, and dendrites are in the uh, spinal cord. So it is a cable of neurons, as you can see, that carries the sensory information up to the brain. So you can see the information going uh, at number five on, this, on the uh, picture, going up to the brain. And you see motor information, six, going down to the body. This is uh, the same path, the same thing that we've been talking about the whole time. So when we look at number one on our chart, we see these uh, things called dorsal roots and dorsal root ganglion. Remember, um, the ganglion is just outside of the spinal cord, so it's connecting to the spinal cord, so it's in the peripheral nervous system if it's not actually in or on the spinal cord. So we would still call that a, a ganglion because it's going from the arm or the muscle 
still outside of the central nervous system. I know it's kind of hard to grasp, but it, uh, you see that information from <clears throat> the bicep is going uh, and from the hand is going to the dorsal root ganglion, which is again a cluster of cells. Um, and then it goes down into the, and synapses in the gray matter, which is where the cell bodies are and where the dendrites are. And from two, we see the ventral root. Um, so motor neurons are leaving the ventral root and going down to the muscle. From the dorsal root, information is crossing over at two and sensory information at five is going, uh, even though it is the, uh, looks like the right hand, it's going to the left side or the opposite side of the spinal cord and uh, going up. So information from the right hand would go to the left somatosensory cortex. Information from the left hand would go to the right somatosensory cortex. Again, majority of that information. Um, so what's connecting the, um, what's connecting this uh, the sensory information to the motor information would be those interneurons, as you can see at five and six, and they are um, superseding that information. So if this was a reflex arc, and this may be a um, repeat if you had me for psych one, let's just say that that hand is touching a hot pot on a stove, and all of a sudden uh, you know it's hot, you realize you made a mistake uh, very, very early on, and um, removing your hand is actually a reflex. So you can see at number two that the interneuron is connecting sensory and motor information. So um, why is it that you move your hand away really quickly as a reflex, um, but you actually don't feel the pain for about a half a second to a second? Well, the actual reflex of moving your hand away is um, at the level of the spinal cord. Um, the interneuron is integrating that information between sensory and motor, so the muscle can make a quick reflexive decision at the level of the spinal cord. But the reason that we don't feel the pain until um, about a half second to a second later is because if you look at number five, you can see that sensory neurons have to go to the brain in order to understand the touch system. So we can move the reflex, reflexively move the muscle at the spinal cord, but the rest of the information has to go up through the spinal cord, through the thalamus, to the parietal lobe, to that somatosensory cortex before we can interpret pain and things like that. So um, there is a little bit of a delay, a half a second to a second, where that information is going up and being processed in the brain. So once again, the actual reflex of moving your hand off the pot or off the hot stove is integrated at the level, number two right there, at the level of the spinal cord. Um, but to actually feel the pain, it has to be interpreted by the brain. So it has to make its way all the way up to the somatosensory cortex. Now, our brain, although it is protected by the um, cerebrospinal fluid from hitting the skull, we also need um, a little more protection because again, our brain is our central computer. It is 20% of our entire energy output and it is um, the thing that allows us to do everything that we do, as I said on the first day of class. So we need a little bit more protection. We know that in addition to um, cerebrospinal fluid, and in addition to um, neurotransmitters, we also have blood flowing through the brain. Um, and we also have a protective covering of the brain, and these protective coverings are called meninges. There's actually three layers of meninges. Um, on the actual surface of the brain is this very thin, almost spaghetti-like. It's very, very thin, almost like a, a weird pasta type of um, membrane um, feeling, very thin, um, called pia mater, which is just lying on the surface of the brain. Um, and it's very soft. And pia means soft. Um, all of these have the word mater, M-A-T-E-R, after them, because it's protecting the brain kind of like a mother protects her young. So pia mater, M-A-T-E-R, means soft mother, because it's a very soft 
membranous material on the surface of the brain. On the outside of the brain, we have a harder, almost shell-like um, type of mater, type of meninge, and that's called dura mater. And dura means tough, like durable. Dura mater means tough mother. So on the inside of the brain, on the surface, we have the soft mother, the pia mater. On the outside of the brain, we have the dura mater. And in between those two, there's a little layer that's kind of spider webby. So it's called the arachnoid um, area. And it's in between the dura mater and the pia mater. And in that subarachnoid area or space, in the spider webby area, is this um, barrier of uh, endothelial cells between the blood and the brain that are protecting the brain from things entering. So just like we saw in chapter two with the um, double layer of cell membrane for the neurons, um, which again, remember, it allowed things like gases and water and things like that to go through, but only allowed ions that fit through those ion channels to go through. And of course that protects the neurons. Well, the entire brain has a barrier like that as well that allows certain chemicals and gases and fat soluble substances to go through, but the, everything else has to go through the cells themselves. Um, and so these endothelial cell layers that protect the blood, it's called the blood brain barrier. And so poisons and things like that, things that shouldn't be getting into the brain itself are for the most part protected. In fact, um, chemicals themselves like dopamine or serotonin can't cross the blood brain barrier and get into the brain. If you've ever um, heard of something called L-dopa, which is the letter L slash uh, dash dopa, um, that is uh, the precursor to dopamine. And although dopamine itself will not go through the blood brain barrier, L-dopa can cross the blood brain barrier readily. And then once it gets into the brain, it gets turned into dopamine. Just like when we talked about tryptophan with uh, turkey and milk and things like that, serotonin by itself does not get through the blood brain barrier, but tryptophan or 5-HTP, um, which is what tryptophan turns into before 5-HT, which is serotonin, those can bo both can cross the blood brain barrier. So that's why when you eat turkey or drink milk, the tryptophan can whoop, go right through this blood brain barrier and then get converted into at least a little bit of serotonin or L-dopa can pass right through this blood brain barrier, no problem. Um, and then it gets converted into, finally converted into dopamine once it's in your brain. And that's supposed to help for the lack of dopamine for people who have Parkinson's. So, um, again, looking at, that was all of the central nervous system. So looking at the peripheral nervous system itself, we see uh, that the bundle of axons that innervate the muscles and face are either called cranial nerves, which go to the underside of the brain, and spinal nerves that connect the um, sides of the spinal cord at each vertebrae to a layer of um, muscle. Um, so if you've ever had an injury, like I know I have, <laughs> uh, a spinal cord injury where I got into a car accident in uh, about 14 years ago, and <clears throat> somebody hit me on the left side near the driver's side tire as I was starting to turn right, and my head went left into the side airbag upon impact. And so I have compression on C5 and C6. So there are um, for, you know, a few sections of spinal cord. C stands for cervical, and it's up uh, a little bit below the brain, about the, the point where my shoulder meets my neck. And on the left-hand side, I have partial numbness on the inside of my forearm, and uh, where, that goes all the way to my thumb. So it's partially numb. It's not completely numb, but I do have partial numbness, and uh, that's because the uh, C5 and C6 are compressed in my spinal cord. And although I try to stretch them out as much as I can, it's um, something that may need to be repaired surgically uh, later in life, but not at 41. Um, so again, the somatic nervous system is um, 
The subsystems of the peripheral nervous system include the somatic nervous system, which are the motor information back down to the muscles. So the motor neurons that go from the brain, motor cortex through the pons, now you guys know the pathway, through the uh, spinal cord, and then depending on where in the spinal cord, which uh, section, um, they go down to the specific muscles. Um, that is one subsystem of the peripheral nervous system. The other one is our autonomic nervous system, which is controlling our smooth muscles, which includes the glands, heart, and other organs, and of course, our um, hormone system. So adrenaline, sex hormones, um, hunger and thirst producing hormones, like things like that, uh, digestion, right? So we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And just to remind you, the sympathetic is the fight or flight. Um, so it ramps up your system with energy. Uh, and shuts off digestion and increases adrenaline in order to get you prepared to either stay and fight or to run away and um, either way get to safety. So the sympathetic nervous system again is called the fight or flight system and um, you know according to the book it activates the body in ways that help it cope with demands. So it's not just actual physical threats to your life but things like emotional stress, and physical energies. And again, most of its ganglia are in what we call the sympathetic ganglion chain. What that does is that prepares the body to go into overdrive. It uh, causes the pupils to dilate. It causes breathing and heart rate to increase. It stops digestion. It increases adrenaline. It increases the sex hormones, um, estrogen and testosterone. Um, it may cause spikes in blood sugar um, and things like that. If we were to stay in this state of mind, right? Anybody that's had an anxiety attack would know that you don't really like feeling this way. So uh, we need something to calm our system down. And normally when we are out of danger or you know, uh, away from anything that can harm us, our body responds by um, bringing us back to a normal functioning level. This is called the parasympathetic nervous system. So it slows the activity of organs. It undoes everything basically that the sympathetic nervous system did. So if the pupils dilated, they're gonna constrict back to normal. If breathing and heart rate increase, they're going to decrease back to a normal level. Um, we're gonna shut off the production of estrogen and testosterone, blood sugar spikes, adrenaline is going to shut off, um, and digest blah, blah, digestion is going to start up again. So I like to call the parasympathetic nervous system the rest and digest system, bringing your body down to a normal level of functioning once again. If we were stuck in fight or flight, um, anybody that's had an anxiety or a panic attack too long knows that it feels really bad. Uh, it can feel like a heart attack. It can feel like uh, something that's really impinging upon your system and it's going to wear out all of those neurons. So the parasympathetic system um, brings us back to what I call, or what we call homeostasis, which means a nice functioning level. Just like we've talked about in the past that your body works best in the 98-ish, 98.6 degree range, um, that your um, resting potential of negative 70 millivolts, give or take, depending on the cells, um, and that your amount of glutamate and GABA in the brain are essentially at a nice area where you have brain activity, but not too much or too little. So our body really likes this um, ultimate optimal functioning. And we will talk all about this idea of homeostasis and being in, the, uh, in a nice stable state uh, when we get to the next chapter, which is chapter six. So um, moving on, we have um, development and change in the nervous system. So uh, there are four um, sort of stages when the fetus is developing, um, when cells are being made, when cells are going to where they're supposed to go and forming connections. So when the nervous system is being built, as we are going from a neural tube 
to essentially um, the nervous system that we know at birth, um, there are four stages that we go through. And yes, these are very important. And yes, there will more than likely be a question about these in a certain order uh, when we get to the next exam. So looking at the first um, stage of development, um, there's a song that my favorite artist, Dave Matthews, um, sings that's not on any album. Um, but he, uh, one of the lines of this song, and the song, you would never know the song unless you looked it up, it's called Ehe, right? E-H-H-E-E. -E -E. Um, because he just sings e -E -E. Um, so I don't know, that's where it got its name, but he says, really, we're just a collection of cells overrating themselves, which is hilarious to me because it's true. When we start out in the nervous system, the first stage is called proliferation. And in this, this is where your cells are basically doing math. They are multiplying and dividing in this area called the ventricular zone, which will eventually be the hole that becomes the ventricles. Um, and so basically when the egg is fertilized with the sperm, what it causes for the embryo is for all of these cells to multiply, to divide, to multiply some more so that we keep producing more and more cells that are going to make us who we are, especially our nervous system. Once those cells are made in the um, ventricular zone, right? Then we see num number two. Part two is they need to migrate to where they're going to go. Now for the first one, number one, um, the really cool thing about this neurogenesis is that these cells are what we call pluripotent. Before they go to their final resting place, they can be made into any cell there is. They can be a hair cell. They can be a neuron or brain cell. They could be glial. They could be anything you need them to be in the nervous system. Um, and so it's when they migrate that they uh, turn into wherever their final resting place is, wherever, they, wherever they're migrating to. If it's cerebellum, they become a cerebellum neuron. If it's basal ganglia, they become a basal ganglia neuron. Um, if it is corpus callosum, right, that'll be part of that axon that goes from one side of the brain to the other. Um, so they uh, need to, um, they need to go where, cells and goes to where it's supposed to go. And the nice thing, as we talked about, is that the nervous system is set up really nicely in nice columns and rows, as long as there's no problems during development. And so these migrating neurons glide their way along these glial fibers, these radial glial cells, and they head to uh, their final place. And because it's, um, as you can see, it's a nice piece of scaffolding, um, they are aligned in a very nice way in columns and rows. But we will get back to this idea of the pl proliferated cells that are pluripotent. Um, I don't know why this says one and two. It should say three and four at this point. Um, that's really strange. So I apologize for that. Number three is circuit formation. Once the cells are in their final spot, those neurons and those axons need to reach out and make connections with other neurons. Obviously, this system continues to build after birth, but we do need to have some um, organization and circuits in place before the um, baby is born. So once um, they migrate to the right place, then they need to sprout out and develop neurons that the developing neurons have to grow towards target tissues. So they use these things called growth cones to form functional connections even before the baby's born because once you're born, you need to have certain connections in order to function. And uh, when you're going through the world and learning new things, those connections are becoming more intricate, they're becoming stronger and things like that. So um, circuit formation goes beyond birth to 
um, the developing nervous system as we are growing up. Um, and then finally, number four, again, I don't know why it says two here, but number four is circuit pruning. So when we are uh, basically reaching puberty, one of the things that happens when we're born, we have a lot of fail safes, right? So we already talked in chapter two about how What's it called? Uh, or it's reuptake and recycled. So we also have more uh, neurons in the brain than we need because in case some of them fail, some of those connections fail, the neurons that develop the connection during circuit formation are the ones that stay strengthened. And we have extra ones in case they don't work. So the ones that are extra are just taking up on uh, useless space in our brain. And as soon as those circuits are nicely developed, by the time we hit puberty or right after, then we have to get rid of the unwanted connections. It doesn't hurt. We don't know. It kind of just gets recycled or, or um, cycled away um, in the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and we never even know the difference. But this idea of circuit pruning also means that the ones that stay, right, the ones that are ineffective that never made connections get whisked away, like pruning the trees in your front yard. Um, and the ones that are connected then um, can strengthen or weaken. And this is what we call synaptic plasticity. All the active synapses seem to become strengthened when we learn things. The inactive ones are the ones that remove, are removed uh, and, you know, discarded. Um, this idea of plasticity decreases as we age, so we're not as flexible um, with our neurons. We're not able to make as many connections. We're not able to learn as many new things. Um, as we are aging, this plasticity is breaking down because our DNA, which is tightly wound, is starting to sort of unravel. So our skin becomes wrinkly, our hair becomes um, gray and, and a little bit more frail sometimes. Um, our muscles decline. Um, and so it's all happening as we age. It sucks, but that's what happens. So those are the four stages. Proliferation one, migration two, circuit uh, formation three, and circuit pruning four. Um, we know that things that you do and things that you take like drugs or smoking, alcohol, um, while pregnant can change the way that the nervous system functions. So why is it bad to smoke? Why is it bad to introduce certain drugs, uh, especially alcohol during development? Because it can slow some of these processes down. It can slow prolif proliferation down so you don't make as many neurons. Um, one of the biggest things that we see with alcohol is um, what we call this birth defect that we call fetal alcohol syndrome. And we sort of touched upon this a little bit, maybe not really much at all, during chapter five in the alcohol um, portion of depressants. The mother's use of alcohol during brain development means less cells made a lot of times. So the brain is smaller and it's malformed and the neurons are dislocated. So what's happening with that, as you can see, um, in A, the, the columns are nicely arranged in vertical rows. Um, but in B, you kind of see chaos, right? They're just kind of everywhere. So it says alcohol exposed cortex fails to form columns and rows. Well, what happens is with alcohol, remember it slows down the system. It's an increase in GABA. So those radial glial cells in the migration are not able to do their job so well. So instead of putting the cells exactly where they're supposed to go, what we end up getting is they're a little too far or not quite far enough or they're not in nice rows. It's not very organized. And if you don't have organized columns and rows, when that information starts to come and you're forming circuits, they're going to be malformed. So some neurons migrate too far. Some neurons don't migrate far enough. They definitely don't go into nice columns and rows. And you can see this when they, um, when animals like mice have been exposed to ionizing radiation, which is a similar effect to alcohol, 
without giving a mouse mommy alcohol, um, we can see that it not only affects migration, but also the number of cells that are made. It affects both proliferation and migration so that when we even get to circuit formation, um, things are already really out of whack. And that's why children, a lot of uh, babies can die early from this and um, it can really, really mess up your nervous system and that controls everything you do. So you can see where um, it is a really, really bad idea for um, moms that are pregnant to drink. All right, what else we got? As we've talked about um, a little bit, um, and as I, I talked about in Psych 1, I don't know if everybody got this, um, but we are continuing to shape our neurons and our connections and our synapses throughout life. And uh, the older we get, the less plasticity we have, but the younger we are when something happens, the um, more easily our brain and our nervous system can adapt and be able to change accordingly. One of the main reasons that scientists think that we have um, cross-sectioning or crossing over of neurons of information um, into the opposite hemisphere is to sort of form a backup plan in case something happens. If you get brain damage early on and it takes out one side of your brain or one side of your body, the other side can compensate for that. So we can see here that stimulation continues to sh shape our synaptic construction um, and reconstruction throughout life. People may lose limbs due to diabetes, war, right? A accidents like plane crashes or car crashes. Um, and when these things are rearranged, when um, you know, uh, amputations happen, when brain damage happens, we see a lot of reorganization. In fact, I talked about how we use 100% of our brains. And one of the things I talked about was um, that even in the absence of use of a part of the brain, let's say that you are born blind. When you're born blind, um, that doesn't mean that the occipital lobe doesn't get any use at all. What it means is um, a lot of the times is the auditory cortex can sort of shift and move back. Because remember, language um, sort of bridges the gap in between those two, which we'll talk about more in chapter nine. So um, the auditory cortex and the auditory um, sense sort of moves back and takes over some of that space dedicated to vision because it's not necessary. If you are born deaf, it is the opposite where your visual system sort of takes over the areas that are unused by the auditory cortex. And so if you've ever heard people who are blind or deaf say that the other sense is a little bit stronger, people that are blind have a little bit better sense of hearing or audition, people who are deaf have a little bit better sense of uh, vision. Uh, it's basically true to a degree because they're taking some of that space and reorganizing in the brain. So this reorganization of motor centers or um, sensory areas like vision or audition is a shift in the connection that basically changes the function of the area. So if we go back to this idea of uh, malformation of fingers or maybe losing a limb. Um, this um, causes those motor neurons and things like that to, or motor areas of the brain, to shift and compensate for these peripheral changes in our body if we lose a limb or a finger or things like that. So it does provide compensation and tries to reorganize, as you can see on the right hand side of this picture, where the neurons are all together. You see the um, you see the square, the circle, and the triangle all sort of together. And then as that malformed hand sort of uh, grows, you see rearrangement of the placing of the triangle, the circle, and the square fingers um, in the hand. So um, it does reorganize itself because the brain is trying to compensate for these changes and trying to do its best job. Um, but reorganization is not always beneficial and sometimes it can actually be harmful. The brain is just trying to make things functional and by doing so, sometimes it goes too far and makes it really hard um, to, to function based on this reorganization. 
So it's, it's good intentions, but it's not always executed the right way because uh, we don't always know what's best for us when we reorganize, right? So um, reorganization is good when you're trying to compensate for the loss of function, but uh, sometimes it reorganizes not in the best way. Come on. We were so good. We were so good up until this point. Do, do, do. How much time now? There we go. Um, so the two most common causes of um, brain damage are um, two things. One is a stroke. The number one cause of brain damage is a stroke, which you, I'm sure you all have heard the word stroke before, but you may not know exactly what a stroke is. And it's, a stroke is sort of a blood clot or a blockage of blood flow in the brain. As the neurotransmitters are all flowing through the neurons, blood is also going to the brain, bringing in hormone messages through the bloodstream, um, making sure that these parts of the brain are alive and, and get blood flow just like the heart. Um, so it is very important. Um, and if there is a loss of blood flow to the brain, you're also losing oxygen to that part of the brain and um, it can cause the neurons to die if they don't have um, the right blood flow. So there are actually two types of strokes. Um, one is called ischemic and the other is called hemorrhagic. Uh, I'll get to that in just a second, but the second most, um, or the second, yeah, the second uh, biggest cause of damage to the brain is actual blows to the head, which we call TBIs or traumatic brain injuries. Um, in the form of concussions and CTE, if we've talked about um, football players. Um, CTE stands for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And encephalitis means you know, trauma to the brain. Um, so basically, it just means repeated hits to the head. Even though they wear a helmet, you're still getting hit uh, basically on every play, especially if you're blocking. Um, so think of that from peewee football all the way up through um, you know, the NFL, you're getting a lot of continuous little tiny hits to the head and that can really add up. All right, getting back to stroke. So strokes can be a blocked artery where blood can't flow through, kind of like a heart attack. It would be a brain attack in that case. We call that an ischemic stroke where it just blocks the blood and the blood can't go through the artery. Um, or the actual blood vessel or artery ruptures and that's what we call a hemorrhage. Uh, brain hemorrhage or a rupture. So a stroke can be ischemic by causing the artery to be blocked, or it can cause the blood vessel to rupture. Therefore, the blood flow is, of course, um, the blood flow is, of course, um, ended. It's limited. So it can't go where it's supposed to go, and that can cause brain damage. Um, one of the biggest things that we've already talked about is if they are, uh, if the blood flow is blocked from certain areas or unable to go, like Broca's area, then the person is no longer able to talk. And a lot of times with strokes, people are not able to think um, or remember things right away. And it can also affect the body. So if it is near the motor cortex, then depending on what side of the brain it's on, if it's on the right side of the brain, you may get some problems in functioning to the left side of the body and vice versa. If it's in the left side of the brain, uh, that's where language centers are, and that could also cause problems to the right side of the body. So if you know somebody, if you had a parent or somebody like that, um, then, um, you know, that could be, that could be bad, um, <laughs> obviously. So the damage basically is due to the fact that not just that the blood isn't flowing through, but that there's no oxygen or glucose because glucose, blood sugar, right? Glucose is energy in the, in the body and in the brain and it causes um, a lack of that glucose to flow through allowing the brain to work. Um, ex excitotosis means the, the destruction of brain cells. Um, so it causes um, no oxygen to come through, no glucose in the blood to come through. This causes the damaging and destruction, killing of brain cells and um, edema, which is swelling. So swelling in the brain, inflammation in the brain is really bad. There's really no room for that. 
with the um, meninges, with the um, other things like that. So uh, this is actually the leading cause of death and disability within the United States. And this is still true in 2020. Although we know that certain other external factors are trying to compete. Um, okay, really bad joke. Um, so the other one is traumatic brain injury and that is due to external forces, which is a blow to the head, um, something that penetrates the skull, kind of like uh, Mr. Phineas Gage. Um, or a sudden acceleration or deceleration, which causes the brain to go through that cerebrospinal fluid protective layer and hit up against the skull. Um, that is what we know as a concussion, and that can cause um, serious problems because it can actually damage the neurons on the uh, lateral side of the brain that actually hit up against the skull. Even trauma that does not produce concussions can still result in brain changes and we see those type of changes in Alzheimer's patients where brain, um, where neurons are being destroyed. So this idea of CTE, this is where that comes in because uh, it's repeated blows to the head that can eventually change it later. We see Alzheimer's and Parkinson's-like symptoms in former NFL players, um, really rapid memory decline right after they play um, and things like that. And I know that I'm a walking hypocrite because I am a neuroscience sort of specialist. Um, and so I know how bad these hits are to the brain. And yet football, I, I, I just can't stop watching it because I love it so much. Um, I would never let Dr. C Carter play it, but man, do I love football. Um, so yeah, I'm a walking contradiction. You can call me out on it anytime you want. So um, does the brain we know that it tries to mend itself. We know that we can reorganize neurons, but, and we know that we have a lot of neurons at the beginning, um, but uh, do we regenerate? Can we regrow? Well, once you destroy the cell bodies with the nucleus inside them, that's it for that cell. Uh, if something was cut, damaged to the axon itself, the axon doesn't contain the life of the cell. So we can regrow severed axons. Um, the myelin itself actually provides this guide tube for the neuron to grow through. And if that's what's cut through and that's what's destroyed, then technically those growth cones from development and the myelin can actually help the axon regrow. But if you destroy the cell body, um, good luck. So what we see, we do see limbs grow back in the amphibian brain. Um, in, and in the mammalian peripheral nervous system a lot of times. Um, but in the central nervous system of mammals like humans, then glia actually uh, end up producing scar tissue where the neuron was um, and growth inhibitors because uh, if your neuron is dead, they don't want something coming in its place. So um, our immune system may also interfere, which means that those cells do not grow back. Um, but that does not mean that we stop making neurons once we're born. There are two main places in the nervous system where we tend to be able to regrow, uh, or, or I'm sorry, make new uh, neurons, which is called neurogenesis. The two places that it appears to support are based on experiences and memory. So it appears to support learning in the hippocampus. And uh, this is sort of, I feel like this is more of a um, new brain um, kind of um, better for humans than, than the animals, um, which is to allow us to still know when we're doing new things, learning new things, bringing in new information, even at an older age. So in the hippocampus, we still get uh, neuro, uh, neurogenesis. And it also helps, and this is where I think it's more of the old brain animalistic instinct, because especially dogs who rely on odor discrimination in the sense of smell more, the olfactory bulbs, which is part of the um, olfactory smell system. So we can still discriminate between different odors and things like that. Yes, it's survival function if we smell gas or things like that, even at an older age. So, uh, but I think it helps animals like dogs more than it helps humans. So there's no evidence that this neurogenesis contributes to self-repair, that it just to make sure your memory is still working at an older age that you can still, you know, 
uh, determine different smells for whatever reason, especially animals, because they rely on it more. And uh, what we do see, though, is when a brain is damaged, we do see more neurogenesis. It's still only in those areas mainly, but maybe it's the brain's uh, way um, uh, to try to aid in recovery. And of course, we can't really do that on our own. Once those cells are hippocampal cells or olfactory bulb cells, that's all they're going to be. So they can't help to um, repair something that's damaged in an area that is not in those two places. But um, we'll talk about that. We also know that the brain can compensate and that un uninjured tissue, as I said, takes over functions of lost areas. I just talked about this a couple minutes ago. So presynaptic neurons sprout more terminals so they can form additional synapses and make sort of a, like a, when a freeway is closed down and take an alternate route, we can do that. Um, postsynaptic neurons can also add more receptors to take up more information. And there are side branches which remain usually silent from adjacent neurons. Those can also activate within minutes of injury and again, help to make this alternative route. So um, not just compensation, but as we've already talked about, reorganization in the nervous system where Again, functions can be taken over by more distant areas. Uh, if the left side of the brain shuts down, function can be enhanced in the right side or vice versa. And typically what we see is this compensation is done in a adjacent area next to where the injury takes place, but sometimes it involves the complete other hemisphere, as I just said. Um, and again, you are more likely to be able to compensate and reorganize the earlier in life that this happens, the more plasticity you have, the younger you are. As you get older, there's less plasticity, which means less chance of reorganization, less chance of compensation. That's why older people who, um, older people um, are not as able to recover from strokes and things like that. Um, so what possibilities does this have? Uh, maybe we can work on growing uh, neuron growth enhancers, uh, providing guide tubes or scaffolding to try to help the brain, uh, counteracting the scar tissue and regrowth inhibitors. Uh, and so the, the basic uh, way to do this is to use those, remember uh, stage one of proliferation, is to use those undifferentiated cells. We ca I called them pluripotent. And those are what we now know as stem cells. These are an ideal means of self of neural repair because they can turn into anything we need. If we lose dopamine neurons uh, in the substantia nigra and VTA, which causes Parkinson's, uh, because those neurons are destroyed, these stem cells can become new dopamine neurons. If we have problems because of brain damage to the cerebellum and we can't walk correctly, then we have... Um, those stem cells can become cerebellum neurons. If we have neurons in the frontal lobe that we're missing because of something uh, or because of a stroke, we can replace them with those stem cells because they can become whatever cells we need. So that's why um, this is very important. Now, I know it's controversial because people have gotten um, worried about uh, things like fetal tissue, abortion, tissue and things like that. But one of the things that people don't know is that most of the stem cells that we um, grow in labs these days are grown artificially and without actual um, aborted tissue or things like that. So it's really not as controversial as people think, but not everybody knows that. So now you guys do. Um, things that we can do to mend the brain, we can use computer chips. We'll talk about this a little more in chapters nine and 10 and 11, um, where um, if the spinal cord is severed, this is why um, information from the sensory system can't go up to the brain and information from the motor system can't go down to the muscles. So we effectively can't move the muscles because they're not getting the signal from the brain. And we effectively can't feel anything. They're numb when they're paralyzed because the sensory signal doesn't go up to the brain. Um, but if we use a chip to make that, remember it's electro and chemical, to make the electrical activity bypass where the injury is, then we may be able to get people who are paralyzed to move in a relatively normal way. People who are deaf to be able to hear using cochlear implants.
next week for you to do two assignments um, based on this chapter. And then uh, the following week we'll do a quiz and I will put up chapter six slides um, soon. Thank you guys for hanging with me and I will talk to you soon.